Sean, good to see you. Good to see you too, man. Thanks for the invite. Of course, of course. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your organization and uh, what you're passionate about? Yeah, so I'm a um, partner in a firm here at ITX. We, we're in Rochester, New York. We're headquartered downtown. We have uh, a couple hundred artists and engineers that work for us. We do innovation all day long, every day. We build software products for companies large and small, everything from um, higher end websites to web platforms, intranets, extranets, portals, software tools. The more complex, the more we like them. Nice. So, yeah. And uh, myself, uh, you know, I've been in this business pretty much since a kid. I started coding at like 11 years old on a Commodore VIC-20 and never really stopped. Um, didn't go to school for, for software. Actually went to school for molecular genetics. <laughs> nice. And then transitioned into software later on in life. And now I teach leadership at the Simon School of Business at the University of Rochester. So pretty diverse set of things that I've done in the course of my life. I love it. You got one up on me though, because I started programming on a Commodore 64. Ah, so a little you know. earlier. <laughs> the generation prior. That's funny. I remember a buddy of mine. I have, I have one of the original. Sorry. This won't need any more memory than it already has. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine had the cassette tape drive for storage. Do you actually? Oh, yeah, yeah. Me yeah, too. Commodore had that too. Yeah, that's right. And the dot matrix printer that would, you literally see the dots being printed. Yeah. <laughs> and we're Great. dating ourselves, man. <laughs> we are. We are dating ourselves. Software certainly changed quite a bit since those days. I actually learned to code by taking the programs off of the cassette tape and you could run a list function. It was line number basic. So you could read the code and figure out how it works. That's how I learned to program originally. Yep. Commodore Basic was my first language too. Actually, come to think of it, I did have a pet for a Commodore pet for a very short period of time, but it was very limited. So, yeah. So now I'm passionate about innovation and leadership and empathy and where those things kind of intersect, and that's what I teach on at the at Simon School and also through um, some other leadership channels. I teach and do some speaking for CEOs and um, and key leaders across America. So. Yeah. So where does it, where does empathy fit? I, I, I love that. So I can hear leadership and innovation. Great. But where does it, empathy fit in the whole, in the whole puzzle? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, I think the, the intersection of leadership and empathy is I, I, I define leadership as a, a function and you could draw it as a mathematical function. I have a little chart that I do for that uh, function of two different forms of, of empathy. It's cognitive empathy, our, our ability to tactically influence the behaviors of others, and then affective empathy, our ability to um, cause more caring to occur in the context of our work together. So if you're leading any organization, any team, it's about getting the team to gel so that innovation occurs. And it, it's really fundamentally, it's about motivation. So all creativity comes from motivation. And what leaders do is they create the space for that. And you do that through your language, through words, through conversations, by um, expanding the horizons of the people that you're leading. So you're giving you're giving them uh, a license to innovate, or how would you how how would you put it? Yeah. Well, can I draw for this, or is this going to be largely audio? Draw away. I'll describe I'll draw it. Away. All right. So <laughs> let's talk about leadership. That's what I like to do. Um, I like to draw. So if you talk, if you think about leadership in the context of um, these two forms of empathy. Here's how it looks like it starts with um, cognitive empathy, which we talk about all the time in leadership circles, this concept of cognitive empathy being um, it's, it's uh, described, it's often described as emotional intelligence or EQ. And they say I, EQ is more of a predictor of success than IQ, right? You've heard this before. And EQ yep. is about our, it's about our leadership capacity, capacity or capability for influencing those around us, for causing behavior change in some context. This is what we want to do. We want to influence the behaviors of others to make something, some change in the world, yeah? And, and when we talk about it, we always talk about ourself being at the center, like we have to be able to regulate, control our own behavior before we can be good at, become good at regulating, controlling the behaviors of others. You know, um, 
lots of social scientists are talking about this today is like shutting down the amygdala response, turning on the prefrontal cortex, like the part of our brain that evolved specifically for empathy. Yeah. And if, if that's you, a lot of, I mean, you've got, you make your own bed folks. You've got Jordan Peterson talking about, you know, work on yourself first before you can crack open and dent the universe. Very similar. Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a, Yes, Simon Sinek and Daniel Goleman, who's done a lot of work at Harvard on emotional intelligence, Travis Bradbury, you know, they all say the same thing. Um, Daniel Kahneman, he wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, same concept. Um, he won a Nobel Prize for his work. He discovered behavioral economics, right? So loss aversion, you know, why we value loss more than we value gain. All the, the puzzles that economists have been trying to figure out for hundreds of years, it's all related to this amygdala it's a the limbic system versus the prefrontal cortex you know the thinking part of our brain yeah um, but if you remember when you were a kid your mom taught you this your mom knew this before any of these scientists came along she used to point at you and say hey at least my mom sean use your words right? <laughs> slow down that was your mom telling you the same thing like shut that part of your brain down let's yep. engage the smart brain let's talk about this stuff and as you go through life you you know your spheres of influence expand the pe the the people that you're able to influence and your family is the people, these are the people that you start out influencing, right? Like you learn leadership skills, you learn how to cause the others to behave around you to get the things that you want out of life. And, you know, your neighbors, your, your friends, your extended family, if you, if you're leading a group, a team, if you're, if you're the leader of a group of people, you're responsible essentially for leading those that you serve, that you call your team, and you're also responsible for leading those that you serve that are outside of your circle that we would call your customers. Right. You're in, you have to influence all of these folks. And um, the higher you up you are up in the, the chain of command here, the more important this is. You know, and there's a linear relationship between this and time too. Like you start out down here and you evolve through life um, to be a leader of something. You know, and that's one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is this concept of uh, affect of empathy. So the word empathy is a bit loaded these days because there's different types of empathy. So cognitive empathy, technical empathy, that's how um, we typically think of leadership, like our capacity for influence, right? Our capabilities. Um, but there's another form of empathy. Folks like Brene Brown are working on this stuff. Or John Gottman, who wrote the book, The Science of Trust. Great book. Yep. And, and this form of empathy is about, is aff, it's called affect or affective empathy. And the way I see it, it's really about compassion or our capacity, our leadership capacity for caring for those whom we lead, our capacity for caring. And it works much the same way. It starts with, and Brene Brown talks about this, you know, you got to, you got to start with yourself or Jordan Peterson, if you're a big fan of his work, you start with the self, figure that out. And then, you know, you, you can expand your spheres of who you care for. Hopefully if you're leading a group of people, you, you expand these spheres to a certain point, you're leading these people, you're responsible for caring for them and expanding their spheres of caring. And you're also responsible for caring for those who you serve that you call your customer, right? right. And this is what leadership is about. It's about, expanding these spheres of caring and influence in the context of your product, your service, this is where innovation comes from, right. our capacity for caring. Now, I draw these charts, you see that I, when I draw these charts on PowerPoint, it's hard to do with a marker, but I draw more dense at the center than at the outside, right? So it's more dense at the center, darker color. Same, same for capacity for influence. So what is it, what does the density <laughs> represent? If it's closer to the center, the Denser. density represents? The density represents your actual capacity is you, you have much more capacity and you have more experiences with yourself than you do with the folks on the outside. If right. you're leading a big enough entity and trying to drive innovation in a big enough entity, you may not even meet all the people that you're leading. Yeah. Especially right? nowadays. It gets more diffuse. It just gets more diffuse. Your ability to lead and care gets more. That's just the way it works. Like when I talk about caring, you know, you have a bank account. Who doesn't? Have you saved money for like vacations and for your kids' college, things like oh, that? Yeah. yeah. But Absolutely. do you save money for your neighbor's kids' college? Uh, neighbor's vacations? Not uh, at like not uh, get. <laughs> not usually. Not usually, right? 
I was going to say against my will, maybe. <laughs> right. So the point I'm trying to make, it gets more diffuse and that's normal. Like that's not, that's just the way it works. Yeah. But here's the key about leadership. Like leadership isn't about your capacity for caring, your personal capacity or your capacity, your personal capacity for influence. It's about, it's about your ability to scale influence mm. through others and your ability to scale caring through others. And this is what, this is what all the great leaders of our collective history have in common. You know, this is what they did. Mm -hmm. Let me prove it to you in a mathematical uh, framework. So if okay. you take these two scales, if you take these two scales and you plot them very simply, plot them like on a linear chart against each other, we've got our capacity for um, influence on the X axis like this, capacity for influence, and our capacity for caring on the Y axis. Mm -hmm. We had a, if we had a system for actually measuring how much capacity for expanding caring we had, you know, with yourself at the bottom, others, and then lots of others. Um, this is a proof. This is sort of a mathematical proof for what great leadership means. Now I've okay. surveyed, um, 1,200 business leaders across America, CEOs, key leaders, and all sorts of companies. Mm -hmm. And I, we see some patterns here. So here's some patterns. People that never learn, people that never learn to influence the world and don't learn to care much for others, when they go out and they get what they want, we have all sorts of labels for these folks, right? Yeah, but aren't there a lot of leaders in that space, though, that seem to have very little caring but lots of influence? Ah, there you go. There are folks over here. So to finish this pattern out, you know, if you study the prison systems, 24% of the people in the prison systems are diagnostically psychopathic by mm -hmm. the DSM standards, right? So these are not, these are the takers of our society. And there are lots of people who, who gain influence, you know, who don't really care much for others. And maybe right. by most traditional measures of success, to your point, they may be seen as successful. Right. You know, you might not want to throw any names out there, but I think <laughs> uh, I think some of the case, so you know the gonna, what was that? You know the type. Oh, I, we well, all know, I the, all type. know the type. <laughs> you know, in the business school, some of the Harvard business Gordon case, geckos of the world. Let's say the Gordon geckos of the world. Go. Okay. There you go. Yeah, in the the Harvard business cases that we study in the in the MBA programs that I teach, Enron or yep. Theranos. Yeah. Like Theranos, she she Elizabeth Holmes, she was able to build a billion dollar organization on a stack of lies. Exactly. Or, you know, the largest pyramid scheme in the history of mankind, right? Mm -hmm. Bernie mm -hmm. Madoff. So lots of examples of high amounts of influence through manipulation. Um, anyway, it's a form of leadership. So, but the the another pattern here is that there are lots of folks that may be highly caring but don't have much influence. Yeah. Exactly. Lots of them. And most of, most of us, I think, are normal, myself included. I think I'm sort of in the middle here most days in this normal range. I call that the normal range. Sometimes I wake up in the morning and I don't want to talk to anybody and I don't have much influence. Imagine that. Yeah, well, we move around like nobody's static in any of these no, things. Yeah. We move around the ranges all the time. That's exactly right. That's exactly And sometimes I wake up and I tell my kids Santa Claus is real and they better go clean their room. <laughs> <laughs> knows what's going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but this defines, here's, here's why I think this defines leadership really well. Now, I, like I said, I've, I've surveyed 1,200 plus leaders across America, and I've asked them, who do they consider the greatest leader? So I'll ask you, who do you consider greatest leader who's ever lived? The rules I give them are, you have to choose someone dead, <laughs> primarily because I don't want to deal with any current politics, because that gets messy. Choose somebody dead? Oh. Choose somebody dead. And choose somebody that I would recognize because although I'm sure your high school coach was an amazing leader, <laughs> how much impact did you really have? You know, it's like, choose somebody I would recognize. Oh, I can't think of anybody dead. <laughs> someone who's inspired you from the past. Come on, it's gotta be somebody. Um, Doesn't that no, have to be a nobody, leader, political leader? I'm a very strange guy. I, I don't get inspired by a lot. I've no. only realized recently that there's a few people who who I uh, do inspire me, but not neither of them are dead. Nope. 
All right. Well, <laughs> I've surveyed a bunch of leaders, and the answers that I've gotten are people like you can put the slide up. Um, it's people like Abraham Lincoln, Mahatma Gandhi, mm -hmm. Martin Luther yep. King, John F. Kennedy, um, Mother Teresa, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She comes up a lot. Nelson Mandela, Maya Angelou. These, you know, I typically get the same list of people. Yep. And you have to ask yourself why. Like, why do I always get the same group of people? And it's a pretty small list. Mm -hmm. if you think about what these great people did. You know, freed the slaves, put a man on the moon, you know, ended apartheid in South Africa, changed the social fabric of India. Yeah, huge things. So, huge, yeah. huge things. They caused a shift in normal people. This is the key. From the bottom left to the upper right. Mm. So in my opinion, that's what we, we should all be striving for that. We're not going to have, we don't have those causes. Like if we're running a business, you know, we're profit mongering capitalists. Right. And, and at the end of the day, um, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to run a, we're trying to, and here's where I see the pattern I see here is that the great business leaders do this. So what you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying is that they, it move, they move, were able to move others yes. up and right. And that's what great business leaders do too. They right. cause the shift from the bottom left to the upper right. They cause the, the spheres of caring and influence to expand. So they build a base of, advocates for their products and services. This is what they do. Um, yeah, so for me, this is like a mathematical thing. And this is where innovation comes from. Because if you have people that are on this path that care about what they're doing, you know, the science of self-determination theory shows us, you know, people, creativity comes from having needs met, needs, important needs like relatedness and competence and autonomy. And when, when you're leading well, you draw this energy out of people. You, you pull people up, and that's where creativity comes from. So, so those, are, my those, life aren't necessarily, those aren't necessarily tied together, though. I mean, you could you could increase caring and increase influence, but you don't have to necessarily increase both at the same time. But that's where the great the leadership comes in. Is it when you do increase both at the same time? That's correct. Yeah, that's what I believe. So, where would you say that somebody like Steve Jobs fits on that? spectrum? Well, that's a great question. Um, personally, my answer would be, I think he changed the world in very powerful ways. And I think, I think, and the way he did, by the way, the one tool all of these folks have in common, one tool across generations, across race, sex, continents, time frames, you name it, they had one tool in common, the language they use, the words they use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The words they use that left us, that left us and, and have caused this shift. So they cause conversations to occur even when they're not around that lead to action. Words lead to action. So if you think of Steve Jobs, and if you look at this in, in the context of a time, in, in the context of times, so if I add a third dimension here, the dimension of time, and now we think about this, we all start out down here, right? Babies are little crazy people until their families socialize them and teach them what it means to behave normally, right? right. And um, over longer periods of time, there's a pattern that I see in really, um, there's a pattern that I see in lots and lots of business leaders. Uh, Carnegie, um, East George Eastman, right here in my hometown of Rochester, New York. Um, uh, Henry Ford, um, even more, more recently, maybe Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, who both pledged 99% of their wealth to um, charities. Yeah. Like that. So there's a pattern that I see where, hey, they figure something, they're going through life, and they figure out a way to extract some economic rent from society, yeah? And there, maybe they have some innovations here, and they're really successful with those innovations and that influence. At some point in their lives, they hit this second mountain, and you see a shift in their behaviors. So you yeah. maybe see behavior patterns... And then all of a sudden you say, oh, man, something happens. They have more money than they possibly could ever spend or need. Yep. Yep. They become incredibly yep. philanthropic, right? That's a pattern that I see. Now, mm -hmm. you didn't see that pattern in Jobs' life. No. Uh, I, I don't, you know, from what I've read. Well, who knows? Like, I mean, he, he may have got, been getting to it, right? He because he did kind of like die before his time. So it's entirely possible that had he, li had he continued to live, he might have gotten to that point. Yes. But... I've studied his language. I've watched, you know, his 
Stanford address and lots of the speeches that he gave. And the man was incredibly insightful and very powerful with his words. You know, you got to start with the experience first. You got to start with the customer and then work backwards from there versus what all these competitors were doing, which was coming up with some whiz bang technology and then figuring out how to sell that. You know, he was very insightful about this shift that he was causing with technology. And he did that through mm -hmm. his products, through his products and services. He may not have personally done that, but he certainly did that with his products and services and with the people that he led. He was an incredibly inspiring leader right. with his words and his actions. So that's my, that's my take on Steve Jobs. But what somebody could argue that uh, the iPhone itself didn't have a didn't have a lot of they didn't listen to a lot of customers to generate to create the iPhone right there wasn't a, it was a sort of a secret project and then boom it was out there and and then it was loved. So this isn't about this model doesn't describe anything about um, listening to customers. I have a whole theory on that. Like okay. yes, yeah, Steve Jobs' famous quote: "He didn't even believe in focus groups, right?" Yeah, exactly. If I asked my customers what they wanted; they would have. Oh, that's Henry Ford, right? They would have told me faster horses. Uh, my, my customers don't, similar, yeah, similar customers don't know what they want until I show it to them, right? That's Steve Jobs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Simil but a very similar mindset. Very similar mindset. Yeah. yeah well, my, my take on that is, you know, there are very, there are very few people out there that are, that are really that insightful. Yeah. And um, most of us aren't, aren't that. We have to navigate it. We have to experiment our way into success. Um, right. So, so, so here we, so you've got influence and you've got, well, influence is largely a external thing though, right? I mean, isn't influence uh, driven by how the rest of the world sees you as opposed to how you can, how you can present yourself to the world? I, I see influence as a function of your competence. Mm -hmm. Like you, it's very hard to be influential if you don't have competence. That's why I call it a capacity. It's a capacity for influence. Like you have to be somewhat competent in order to achieve anything. So it's a function of your ability, your actual ability to cause this change to occur. And, and I've got a bunch of deeper frameworks that kind of that describe how this works. But in, in my opinion, it, it's largely about creating a group of advocates for your cause. Like it's about creating the language, vision, understanding who you serve, what problems you solve, and how, how, you, how you're gonna know that you're successful and drawing people into that created future together um, I, I have a framework, I call it the momentum framework that describes how to, how to do this, like specifically. And, you know, you know, there's, there's a line, if you draw a line down the chart here, um, I believe most of us normal people, about half the time we spend below the line going about our lives, you know, and leading, leading in sort of a manipulative way. Yeah. Because it works. It's expedient. That's where the Gordon Geckos of the world live. Yeah. Yeah, but we do too. We do things yeah. like I said. Well, everybody does. I mean, human beings, we, we, it's part of our DNA to manipulate. It's part of we our DNA. We might not call it that. We might not call it manipulation, but we do it. That's what, but that's what we're doing. Yeah. You know, and what we, what we, we want to do is we want to do things that are more inspiring. We just don't know how. And um, I think great leaders do. They do it by default. They kind of do it out of gut. And the key is to keep the ratio of inspiration, inspiring leadership behaviors to manipulative leadership behaviors, right? It's to keep the ratio high. <laughs> because right. this type of behavior in, in leadership is more is more sustainable. Like if you're using this, you got to keep doing it. You right. get low quality motivation out of this type of behavior, but this you get high quality motivation out of it. So I've created a framework. Um, it's a much longer conversation, but I've created a framework for how leaders can actually cause more inspiration to occur through having a clear vision, making sure that they're motivating their teams. And then on the, on the competence side, making sure that they have the right capacities in place to, do, to execute and that they're, they have skills, tools, and capabilities to grow. So, so where does innovation come in at this point? Does it, is it, like part of the concepts that they're, they're dragging people into that, into that is actually, let me backtrack a bit. I'm looking at your graph and I'm yeah. going, isn't that is the perfect place to be like a 45 degree angle directly from the point zero? I think so. But you know, it's different in every ecosystem and that's what the leaders got to figure out. Right. Uh, and then, so where does, where does innovation, how do you drag innovation out of that? All right. So here's my, here's my belief. 
if you have the right goals and you create the right environment, you so I call this the shift from the bottom left to the upper right. I call that momentum. You're causing right. more caring to occur. You're causing more influence to occur through your products and services. Yeah. Yeah. So you're causing the shift to occur. If you have good metrics, so if you know, you'll know that you're causing momentum to occur. So let's say we have good metrics for measuring momentum, which mm -hmm. I have in my framework. So I can teach that. Over time, you're going to get these things called innovations from your team because they'll have a shared understanding of what success looks like. And if you do it right, they'll care about it. They'll right. actually care about creating that thing called momentum. Okay, hold on a second. How do you get that shared understanding of what needs to go? It's like, is it like leadership vision or how do you get that? That shared <laughs> understanding. You create metrics that show how you're going to move the needle on the human relationship, how you're going to cause caring to occur and be influential. And the metrics, it's all about the language that you use. And it's right. all about finding the right metrics. This is what I believe. If you have those metrics in place, I, I have a proxy for this. I call it like trust and loyalty and advocacy. And if you if you can see those, you can see that you're earning more trust and you're building loyalty and you're building advocacy for your products and services, you've got momentum. So I've got I've got a whole framework for teaching leaders how to create trust, how to create it, how to measure it, and then how to create it, how to create, how to measure loyalty, how to create it, how to measure advocacy, and how to create it. If you have them, see what happens is most businesses they they operate on the status quo. Like they just they're just going through the motions and they may make a profit. Um, do you know who Grace, Grace Murray Hopper is? She was, no. the, she was the first female U.S. Navy Admiral. Oh, cool. Ever. And she also was one of the early programmers of the football programming language. She's no way. Responsible, she's responsible for the term bug. <laughs> is she the Grace one who Murray discovered Hopper. the first bug in the system? Yeah, she called it. It was like a bug inside of a transistor or something that they actually found. <laughs> but she's also responsible for the phrase, the most dangerous words in business are... This is how we've always done it around mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. We've always done. So that's Grace Murray Hopper. Um, when we have an innovation, what happens if we're leading well, right? We're leading well and we're smart. We cause this thing to occur. Um, I define an innovation as any tactic or idea that when we deploy it, we see it arise in momentum. Mm -hmm. Trust, loyalty, or advocacy. We'll know because we'll have metrics for that. And when we have a, an innovation, we get value out of that for a period of time, yeah. right? And it, it's, it decays, it's gonna decay, it's gonna start decaying right away. Um, and at the apex here, you know, either your competitor copies you or they come up with a better innovation or it just becomes the status quo in your industry. But yeah. while you've done that, in that interim time, you've captured a whole bunch of goodwill in the form of trust and loyalty and advocacy. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if you're a really good leader, You'll have another, and you'll have another idea in the future, and you'll get it again. Don't th shouldn't those overlap though? No, no. This is time based. So, okay. You, think about it, you, you come up with an innovation, you get value. You come up with another innovation, you get some value. Here's the key: what great leaders do, whether they realize they're doing it or not. Steve Jobs, I think, is one of these people. He had, he had a way of doing this. Is they cause what Daniel Goleman calls open awareness in his book, Focus, or mm -hmm. Kenneth O'Stanley. Kenneth O'Stanley, a, he's a pretty famous AI researcher. He's got a talk, he wrote a book called, uh, titled, Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. It's, mm -hmm. about it. it's a great book, it's a short book, you should read it. He's actually trying to take AI and cause creativity to occur from AI. It's, it's brilliant, it. brilliant work. So, but he's figured out, like, it doesn't work that way. You can't just force innovation in any context, like Archimedes in the bathtub, it just hit him, right? But it hit him because he'd been thinking about it and thinking about it and think he had open awareness around the problem he was trying to solve. Exactly. Right? So if you, if you can create the right open awareness with the right metrics that are informing the conversations that are occurring in the hallways when you're not in the room, then your whole team's thinking about this. And if, if you use metrics that people actually care about, See, the, the thing about self-determination self theory, which I mentioned earlier, understanding the purpose. Like if people feel, understand why they're there, like I'm here to make someone else's life better, they care about that. And if they yeah. can see it happening at some sort of scale, like, hey, I did this I did this thing and I saw an increase in trust, loyalty, or absolutely. It's informing the conversations. They care about that. 
they'll be thinking about it. And when you least expect it, it's no longer you that's coming up with the ideas. It's them. And you get these little incremental micro innovations potentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll be big and sometimes they'll be small, small, but this is the key. This is the key to innovation is you need to, you need to maximize the number of people that are thinking about the problem in your domain and engage them in that problem so that you're using the part of their brain that they're not normally using. Like the part there, you, you're using the, those cycles that are occurring under the surface, you know, the subconscious, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. I can tell you, you know, how many times, you know, things come to me when I'm sleeping or when I'm about to wake up because I've been thinking about them for days, you know, and all of a sudden you have that insight. Oh, that's when the best stuff happens. It's that's when the totally best stuff happens. So this is where innovation comes from. It comes from this open awareness, open awareness from a lot of people. Um, because here's the other thing. Idea, so innovations only come from ideas. And if you run a business or if you run a team long enough, you know most of the ideas you get suck. They're terrible. Right. Yep. They're useless. Um, and, and knowing what to try and what not to try, that's like a leadership skill because you're going to get a lot of ideas. If you have a good thing going, a lot of people are going to send a lot of ideas your way. Mm -hmm. um, but without those ideas, you don't have any chance for innovation. So innovation comes from ideas. Ideas only come from people. Ideas only come from people. Yeah. They only come from people who care about your future. Otherwise, they have the idea and they go somewhere else with it or they just let it go because they're not going to invest yeah. in telling you about it. Yeah. So in maximizing the number of advocates in your ecosystem then becomes the goal if you care about innovations. Because not, not just amongst your customers, but also amongst your people, your team, the people working on the products. And if right. you're the leader, you should be the prime advocate thinking about this stuff all the time. Exactly. So what, so are, your thoughts, people, what are your thoughts on the differences between like individual innovation and collaborative? Right, there's no such thing. Ideas always come from people. They could come in a collaborative environment, but individual. someone, what's that? They're all individual? No, yeah, every innovation right. comes, I mean, the, the actual innovation, the point at which says, hey, somebody puts these two ideas together and it becomes something new. Somebody has to do that. There has to be an observer that has open awareness, that cares about the future of this thing you're doing together there's a person has to come up with it. Now it often occurs in a team environment. I run workshops and we have ideas all the time in those workshops. So you yeah. can attribute it to the group, but there's mm -hmm. someone in that group that actually seeded that idea or, you know, shared it or came out with it. Yeah. It comes from an, an individual mind is where the idea comes from, but then you know, obviously people the build on it. Yeah. That's right. I've had people say, well, a patent is, you know, an innovation. I have this patent and it's, this thing that's abstract and that's an, that could be an innovation or I could apply this patent and that, but that patent came from some smart mind and even more important, some smarter mind had to look at the patent and figure out how to apply it so that it actually yeah. turns into an innovation because it's not actually an innovation until it has adds value to the world until right. it creates some goodwill. Hopefully that turns into revenue. Yeah, not necessarily so. Although uh, a, a lot of people who have talked, some people who have talked to said, unless it, it generates revenue, then it's not an innovation. But I disagree with that. I do too, actually. I, not just, it's not just revenue because it could be something that really makes your team perform better or causes your team to care more about each other. That's an innovation. Like you'll get more longevity out of that. It pays off in spades. It pays off financially at some point in the future somehow. But you, I agree 100%. It's not always revenue based. I, no, I, lo I love this model, but it seems like difficult to get to. I mean, how do we go from where we are now to where this is? You gotta sit through one of my workshops, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sales pitch, just like that. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a, like I said, I have a framework. It's called the Momentum Framework, where we dissect all the different components. Like, it's complicated. Like, leadership is complicated, and it, it starts with visioning. And then you move from visioning to making sure the team's motivated by that vision. Because if they're not, where are you going? And then I mean, you got to work on, sorry. A lot of times you don't even get to the visioning. I mean, I work for companies where, you know, there's there's absolutely no, there's no vision. There's just like, we're just going to keep on making money the way we've been making money. There's no vision. How do you how do you convince these leaders that you they need, your, your people need vision, at least? Well, my belief is, we're all going to die if we don't keep it. If we don't continue to innovate, the company's eventually going to die. And every leader knows that. 
Yeah. So in order to, in order to get those innovations, even the even in a well established, let's just use an example here, even in a well established fast food chain, right? You could perform better. Like let's, I used to work at McDonald's when I was a kid, so let's just use that as an example. You, you can have two different groups of people working in the same store produce very different results for the firm in terms of repeat customers and advocates, mm -hmm. employee retention, employee satisfaction, right? And the creativity that they apply to the customer experience. See what I'm saying? Even at that level, like it's an established firm, there's, this is how you're gonna make the French fries. You're not gonna change that pattern. Like th this is how we make the best French fries. We know that, but people still have, can apply their creativity to innovate on how they treat customers and how they treat each other to, to raise the, the bar on customer advocacy and internal advocacy. And they might even come up with an idea to make the whole process better and help all the other chains. You know, that's that's a possibility. All the other yeah, restaurants- Yeah, just because it's at the micro level doesn't mean it's worthless. Yeah, exactly. I, I believe, I really believe heavily in driving small innovations as well as big in it. We always wanna be looking for the big next innovation, uh, but the small ones matter too. And I, I, I believe that in any innovation is, um, is good for the company, it's good for the firm and it should be celebrated. And it builds your culture. So when you when you see that happening, it feeds the culture and you have this, um, yeah, you get this self-fulfilling prophecy of more innovation. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and I, and I, lo I love the concept, but like I said, I mean, how do you, how do you convince people to go there? I mean, I, a lot of these pe pieces are, 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 they seem like a lot of work. Hmm. Well, that's the job of leadership. It's hard work. There is no magic formula for innovation. Anybody that tells you there is, they're insane. It just doesn't work. You need to put the hard work in. You need to put the effort in. You need to understand how it works. And you need to create the space for open awareness. You need to create the space for those innovations to occur. And like I said, the more minds you have thinking about it and caring about it and competent in it, the more likely you are to get really profound innovations that, that move the needle. And you know, make a difference in the world. So, so going back to your other chart, where you were talking about influence and caring. Yeah. So, what's a, what's an ideal first step? Do we should we look at that and say, where do I see myself in this chart, and then yeah. work towards? Uh, if you're down near the influence part, you know, work towards the caring part, and if you're down near the caring part, work towards the influence part. In my opinion, the place to start. So let me redraw the chart so it's not so complicated because that one's getting a little messy. Okay. In my opinion, the place to start, capacity for caring, capacity for influence. We want to move people in this general direction. The place to start is to create alignment around what you're trying to do in the world. Like how you're trying, what, what it will look like. What will the future look like if you've done this in the context of your products and services? And I'll tell you what the answer is exclusively. The answer is we have expanded our base of advocates. And I'm going to, I'm going to draw them somewhere around here. So you basically look into the future and say, this is where I want to be. And then you yep. work backwards from there. I want to have more of these right. advocates. And I'm, I'm, I'm using the word advocate because I can't find a better word in the English language to describe what I mean. So let me define, let me redefine it for you. When I say advocate, I mean, people, people willing to invest in our collective future willing to invest in our collective future. Right, and when you go back to all of those leaders you talked about earlier, these are movements, basically. That's what they People did. who are part of the movement. They're part of the movement, yeah. And I, when I say this, I mean the people working on the product and the customers. Like we wanna build that ecosystem and we wanna maximize these, these advocacy relationships that we get from these people, you know? And, and you have to go through stages to get there. Like you can never, get to advocacy unless you first go through a phase that I call loyalty. What does that look like? So define it, come up with a metric for it, understand it, and that's what we're driving for. And you never get to loyalty unless you first earn this thing called trust. And we can create a metric for each of these things if we're purposeful about it and we take the time to define what we mean when we say trust. Because over time, over time, that's where we want to go. And that's what great leaders do. So this overlays with the map, the other map where great leaders live, right? So you cause this shift 
in normal people to trust to cause more trust foundationally, you cause more trust to occur, you cause more loyalty to occur, and you earn more advocates. That and when you get to this point, when you get to that point where you've got you've got a base of advocates that's growing, you have all of these people thinking about your problems and caring about your problems that you're solving, what your products and services do that are creating these feedback loops. You have a funnel of ideas that's ex ever expanding because they care about your future. So that's the place to start is set a metric for that. Let's talk about that word. How will we know we've got that? How do we know that somebody is an advocate? It's through their human behaviors and you can measure human behaviors, right? And you create the open awareness in your, in your customer ecosystem. That's what you're after. That's the theory. So you have to go back, but you have to go back and figure out where you are, or if you start at the end and work backwards. If, if, if you're asking me for a formula, I always suggest starting at the end, like what's the future we want to create, and then work backwards from that. And it's hard because most, I, I think most organizations don't even have a really good grasp on who they're serving. Right. Who is my population of customers? Like I want to serve the whole world. Like, no, like let's hone in. Like every product or service is really engineered to serve a small group of people first. Like, and we, we talk about like in our industry, it's um, this MVP concept that has been exploited. Like let's get something to market fast and test it, blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't think that's a good approach. I think first you should start with who you're serving. Like understand the consumer really, really well and the problems that you can solve for them and turn them into advocates as a result of your solving that problem in a unique and special way you know, then figure out all the features you're going to build to solve those problems. Like, let's start with the person, with the people that we're serving. That makes That's sense? interesting, because one of the things I've always thought is that you should actually start with your audience before you start yeah. with your customers. Yeah. Like, I think it was Seth Godin. Sorry, go ahead. What were you going to say? The, the people who, if, like, if you create an audience first, then these audiences may actually just follow you where, wherever you go. Agreed. Seth Godin has this concept of, uh, I can't remember, it's M minimum viable audience or minimum valuable audience or something like that. Like figure that out first. Get your minimum valuable audience and then figure out how, what problems can I solve to turn them into advocates. Yeah, That's and that can be done way before you have a product even in okay. mind. Because if you've, got, if you've got your advocates or at least a small group of advocates, that'll help lead you to where you wanna build. For sure. And yeah. you know, they'll help you build it. Like in the software space, you don't build a great software product without, this ad, without a group of advocates. Like you need beta testers, not beta testers that you pay, like beta testers that care about the product and care about the problems it's solving for them. And they'll volunteer. If they have those problems, they'll volunteer. Um, you yeah, need, so if you think you about need, it, startup founders are kind of going at it the wrong way completely because they're, they're, they're coming up with an idea and then they're like creating the idea and then putting together beta testers. And it's like, it's just this linear flow and the reality is it's just start with who they're going to be serving first and work backwards. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. Just like Steve Jobs said, start with your customer and work backwards from there. <laughs> did he say that? He did say that. Oh, that's, cool. Yeah, that's in one of his famous speeches that floats around the internet. Nice. nice. All right, so let's let's talk about the future. It's sure. 2031. Where where will we be? Are we going to be? Are we going to have more leaders looking at this and going, "This is what I want to do"? Or you think you think we're going in the right direction generally? Totally. I, I yeah. see lots of trends. You know, you've got bureaucracy, you've got uh, capital, conscious capitalism, you've got a bunch of trends that I see, um, and you've got this next generation of people in the workforce that really care about why they're showing up to work. And you, you, have, you have people that are um, like Adam Grant and Simon Sinek and, and even Jordan Peterson to some degree. Like if you're going to put your life energy into something, it better have meaning beyond just, you know, earning you a paycheck. And here's the trend I see. I see more and more leaders are thinking about this. Like think of business models like Tom Shoes or Warby Parker, where you buy something and a couple of things go out into the world and make the world a better place. Like people care about that. And that's, that, is, that is a trend. Um, and it's, it's going to continue. And the greatest business leaders, here's, the pat, here's another pattern I see. They take the profit that they make and they make sure that they take care of their people and they, they grow their people. They invest in their people with some of that profit. 
They invest right. some of that profit into their customers. They invest some of it into research and development. They make their industry better. They, they contribute to the product space. They invest some of that into their communities. They give a little back. Yeah. And they're purposeful about it. And they incorporate that into their mission and their language. They make sure they take less from the planet than they get back to it. Yeah. They make sure they pay their taxes and invest in their nation because they're taking advantage of services. And then, then after all of that, and they've, they've got some clear structure for that, then some money goes back to the shareholders because this is a capitalistic society and these people took a risk and that's the game we're playing. But they're purposeful about this and they communicate it well. And that is a trend I don't see, I don't see reversing anytime soon. Like you're, you're seeing a lot of these, these younger folks putting their money where their mouth is and spending a little more money for the thing that's ecologically right or the sustainable, you know, the sustainable solution versus the thing that's helping somebody make a big profit. I think that's a trend that's not going to reverse. Yeah, and if you think about it, basically what they're what people are doing is they're thinking beyond just the business. They're thinking just okay. beyond just sort of surviving. Because if you think about it, it's 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 kind of like a really myopic view where you're just thinking about shareholders. We've got profits, we've got shareholders, and that's it. And they don't see how the, the business itself affects the rest of the world, right? So if you, yeah. you bring out a new innovation that's going to, you know, um, kill 2 million jobs, you've got to figure out some way of solving that. You don't have to, you don't just say, okay, you know what? I'm just going to kill 2 million jobs. That's it. It's like, think about, think about the, you know, the consequences of what you're going to create. And then like outside of what, what you're going to actually make out of it. I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. You know, uh, Milton Friedman, he destroyed capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, with this, you know, the purpose of the firm is to create shareholder value and that's pretty much it. And everything we do should be focused on that. And, you know, that puts us in this position of manipulation so that it's about intent. Like if you believe that, then you're only doing these things to kind of hoodwink your shareholders or the people, you know, that are buying the stock market. I think that's just a bad strategy. Like it's about, this is about intent. And I do, I do see a trend. I do think it's going to continue that way. Um, People want to live in a better world. They want to make the world a better place. I'm a, I'm also an internal optimist. I get criticized for that all the time, but that's well, how I, I, I believe in abundance <laughs> and I believe in optimism. And I think, um, yeah, that's what I, that's what I believe. I love it. And, but the thing is, it's not just, I don't think it's just the money. It's not just the investment, right? It's the whole, uh, way of operating to to look at you know not just your not just yourself but your effect in the world so don't just take your profits and plow it back into these other things actually you know build your products in such a way that they will positively affect humanity you know as soon as they leave the building yeah absolutely be purposeful yeah yeah very very cool awesome so thank you so much this has been great and uh yeah, can you if somebody wants to get in touch with you what's the best way um, well, you can put some links out, itx.com. Um, if you want to send me an email, it's flaherty at itx.com. You can find me on LinkedIn, Sean Flaherty. I'm all over the place. It's not hard to find. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I definitely put all your contact information in the show notes. If anybody wants to get in touch with you and uh, we'll get that ha happening. So any final words or are we good? No, thank you so much for having me. I really, uh, really enjoyed my time with you. Thank you so much. And I love got a lot of links in the in the chat that I'm going to bring into the show notes as well. So thank you so much. Talk All to right. you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.